Hello, and welcome back to Outward, Slate's podcast about everything LGBTQ. I'm Brian Lauder. I'm an editor at Slate, and we are going to get right into things today. No chatter up top, because we have, as they say, a very special episode for you this week. Our own Jules Gold Peterson is going to be in the hot seat. Jules, are you ready for that? <laughs> It feels so different. I'm very excited. Who knows what's going to happen? This is uh, an outward first for me. Yeah, it might get wild. We'll find out. Uh, (laughs) You are in the hot seat because Jules has a fantastic new book out. It's called A Short History of Trans Misogyny. And though the title is sort of demure, this one packs a really remarkable amount of history argument and storytelling into its svelte, like 150 or so pages. Um, I will tell you that just in reading it for the podcast, it is like expanded and at times like challenged my thinking about the subjects it covers, about the hatred, the fear, the tokenizing of trans femininity that seems to pervade our world. Uh, And it's inspired me to consider like more deeply the relationship, especially between trans femininity and like quote unquote gay male culture that I hold very dear and talk about a lot. So it's a really rich and important book. um, And I can't wait to honestly read it again and learn more from it because it bears that much attention. So we've got a lot to talk about in that. But first, I did just want to take one minute to acknowledge that we got some thoughtful pushback on our last episode about All of Us Strangers, uh, Andrew Hay's new film. And we hear you. We are gathering those notes. We're going to respond to them soon in a future pod episode. So if you've got more thoughts about that that you haven't sent, please keep them coming. We'd love to hear from y'all and we will we will be addressing that spicy feedback soon. Spicy but good feedback. Yes, very good. Very yeah, good. Sorry. Yes. Appreciate- much yeah. appreciated feedback. We love we love to hear thoughtful feedback and we appreciate it and take it seriously. Okay, we're going to take a short break and then we will be back to talk about Jules's fantastic new book. So here's where I would normally give like a gloss on what the book's about and introduce the author, but that feels weird to me. (laughs) So I thought we might, if you don't mind, Jules, just turn it around a little bit. Um, Jules, who are you? (laughs) No, we don't have to do that. But what's, what's sort of the pitch of this really fantastic book? I've got all kinds of questions about it, but I'd love to hear your just sort of elevator pitch about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, this, I'll say this, this is a book that emerged out of concrete angst, exhaustion, anger in my own life, right? I had felt like, okay, there's this term trans misogyny that like trans women use or trans people, you know, use often in our own kind of in-group conversations. But I kind of wonder just about like, what does that term even mean? Where, Where, you know, not where did the term come from, but what is it trying to capture And, you know, the first place it led me was, of course, violence against trans women, which is sort of like the currency (laughs) through which trans women, particularly of color, like appear in our culture as subjects of violence. I mean, it's something we talk about on the show. Yeah, basically, classic Jules Gill Peterson move. I am a historian. I was like, well, I have a feeling that the way we're talking about this phenomenon, our fixation on violence against trans women probably doesn't really help us understand where that violence came from. But I wanted to just do the basic work of saying it has a history and for two simple reasons. There's a lot of denialism about trans mm. misogyny. That's like one version of, you know, so often transphobia is, you know, takes the form specifically of denying trans women's experiences, their womanhood, but also like the worst things that would ever happen to them are denied. And so giving it a history is partly about establishing foundation and evidence, where I hope, you know, giving people the opportunity to be like, for what it's worth, here's a whole ass book that says this is real, okay? Um, But secondly, you know, it's really, for me, about following the leads of history. And I think what's what I was so excited and myself a little challenged to find out is the places we might think to turn to understand violence against trans women and a broader culture of trans misogyny. Maybe the two places off the top of our head might be like mm, interpersonal violence, intimate partner violence, like, oh, men. Men are somehow violent and can't handle being around trans women. Like intrinsically so or something. Yeah, like, some yeah. kind of psychological problem, right? That yeah, and then maybe yeah. like... TERFs and a trans exclusionary mm. feminists who claim trans women aren't really women but are but are men and predatory men at that. And in fact, what I found historically is that 
neither of those are really the the main sources of trans misogyny. It, it really, I was led on a really unexpected historical tour of the past 200 years for a number of places in the world and really came to see that actually trans misogyny first of all, kind of precedes <laughs> modern trans women in the world, that there's this kind of structure of violence that starts affecting whole populations of people who aren't trans, who aren't trans women, but starts to sort of trans feminize them, make them more like trans women in their experience of the world. And, and anyways, that kind of history, that unexpected answer to the question, where does trans misogyny come from, or where does violence uh, against trans women come from, that's what really led me to writing this series of kind of stories that give us a really different account, I think, than what we're used to hearing. Uh, and I hope that that's really useful in us understanding concretely like why it's so hard to actually stand up and stand with trans women in the real world, and also why, in fact, trans misogyny is something that kind of concerns everyone else. Like you said at the top, uh, you know, it concerns gay men. It does concern straight men. It does concern non-trans women. But it also concerns a whole bunch of groups of people all over the world that actually otherwise have nothing in common. And I just think it's a really fascinating kind of lens to which to think about how you know, sexual and gender violence uh, are actually pretty central to the way uh, the world we live in is organized. And trans women are actually kind of, or trans femininity, they're both at the heart of that story instead of being kind of peripheral or just a special case. I think one good thing to do before we dive, I want to dive into all of the history that you're talking about and those the groups that you, that you sort of, whose stories you tell. Um, but I think it would be good because you do this in the introduction really helpfully, a bit of work around terms and concepts. Um, specifically, you, you know, of course, we're defining transmisogyny. I think that's fairly clear to people, but um, you really push us to move from thinking about trans transgender women or even the word transgender itself, right? Uh, to this, you use this phrase already, trans feminization or people being sort of made to, you know, read as trans femme. Can you just unpack that briefly? Because I think it'll be helpful in understanding, you know, sort of the rest of the rest of what we're going to talk about. Absolutely. This was like one of the big <clears throat> things I had to figure out in order to, to make this <clears throat> book work, because, you know, just to give you know, listeners context, the reason that I felt words like transgender or even trans women, trans womanhood were insufficient. So I was like, well, clearly trans misogyny affects more than just trans women, right? Um, and also trans misogyny is so weird because often the form it takes is just like homophobia. And so it can like definitely, you know, pull in people who don't identify as trans women. And I was just like, well, then we need to figure out how to describe that. But then the mm -hmm. real, real sticking point for me is I was like, hold on, there's this particular form of like feminizing sexualization, you know, sort of treating, feminizing someone by sexualizing them that sort of emphasizes their feminine supposed maleness and turns that into a threat. That's the kind of like trans panic version of trans yeah, misogyny. Yeah. Well, that has like a really robust history, but it all started being applied to people who weren't trans women. Like I talk about, you know, hijras in colonial India, or even like, you know, um, very effeminate fairy sex workers in late 19th century New York. These are not trans women. So if they're being affected by the same pattern of violence, then I don't want to actually obscure that by just like calling them trans women. Also, I'm a historian. I just like can't bring myself. You can't, to right? You can't, you can't like, do that. Sorry, yeah. I, I'm, I'm like that. And so, transfeminizing, yeah, you turn it sort of turn it into um, a verb or into a process, right? Kind of draws our attention to how, yeah, regardless, regardless of how someone identifies, regardless of how they see themselves in terms of gender and sexuality, there is this peculiar form of power that ensnares certain kinds of people uh, and subjects them, basically. It pulls them into the orbit of trans femininity because trans femininity, as distinct from trans women, right, is what is trans femininity, right? Like it's very often, I think, um, like an image projected onto people. It's a set of expectations mm -hmm. about what femininity looks like when it's not something you get to claim <laughs> as the inheritance of what you were assigned at birth, right? It's not just like, yeah, it's not just a semantic distinction. I actually think trans femininity is is a really high stakes kind of appearance that can be projected onto people or a rumor or a reputational thing, right? Um, it, it can yeah. have real consequences. And so to me, being able to have 
all of these terms, right? Trans misogyny affects trans women. Great, right? I'm a trans woman. It affects me. Okay. I, I express trans femininity. People have all these expectations about trans femininity. They see those on me, right? But actually, this sort of process would allow me, I don't know why I'm using myself as the example, but it's kind of helpful to talk about, for example, the way I was treated as a child or an adolescent mm. when I was very frequently sexualized and feminized. I was sort of the way I, I didn't quite understand it at the time, but in fact, I was not treated like a boy, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, yeah. But I was not treated like a, you know, a non-trans girl either. I was treated very specifically, right? And so I could understand that I was trans-feminized, that expectations around trans-femininity were projected onto me and had real consequences for me even before I understood mm -hmm. myself as a trans woman. And so I think just having some of that kind of linguistic specificity, I hope feels like, helpful to people instead of making it more complicated it lets us be precise and it also helps like yeah. i think relieve anxiety right because like you know if we just talk again about the relationship between you know gay panic and trans panic i think one of the reasons it can make us all so uncomfortable is we're like well misrecognition makes us feel really queasy about the fact yeah. that like there is yeah. a weird intimacy between gay men and trans women but like Sometimes that intimacy is like the violence done to them, but it's not always like, ooh, what do we do with that? And I actually <laughs> think being able to make those distinctions and name them also allows us to be like, I don't know, just to feel less anxious about how we talk about some of this stuff. So you just mentioned uh, when you were talking about one of the most impressive things about the book to me, kind of exciting things, is that you definitively state an origin for trans panic, trans misogyny at like a specific place in time with the Hijra in India. Can you and, and under the British colonial occupation, can you tell us a little bit about why you feel so confident? It's, it's very confident, right, for like a historian. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I love I love that. So I'd love for you to just talk about why you're confident and tell us that story a little. You know, something about being a trans woman and historian, you gotta be real confident. Okay. But actually, you know, the process of doing history is about um finding evidence, right? Following mm -hmm. the actual empirical leads in the traces, you know, left behind in different archives. But then a lot of it is so it's evidentiary, right? Um, but then a lot of it is corroboration, right? You might mm, find mm -hmm. something and you're like, oh, whoa, I think this explains why something emerged at this time or what, how something was changing over time. But then as a historian, you have to find many corroborating examples. And so, yeah, that's sort of how I was looking here. I was like, all right, in the present day, trans panic is understood mostly in the context of law. It's like a legal mm -hmm, defense mm -hmm. that people use to get acquitted or have charges or uh, penalties reduced for attacking or even killing trans women. And the panic the is sort of the trope of like, I was deceived exactly. by this woman. And so I whatever I did was was just yeah. or, or excuse, excusable, right? Yeah. And I had been kind of just counting backwards in my unusually extensive knowledge of trans history. I was like, <laughs> how far back do I find trans women narrating it in exactly those terms? One of the things that you trace throughout the book is the sense that trans feminized people are especially killable. Um, this is a, a word, a use of that word that I've, uh, killable is, not, you know, I've never even seen that particular uh, part of speech with it. And I, I, th I think it's very striking and of course, you know, unsettling. Tell us a little bit about um, you, you particularly pick up on this uh, sort of in the next stage of your history, which uh, is with characters you have Jenny June and Nancy Kelly, people sort of around the turn of the century who are being feminized in a different way, maybe proto-trans women, possibly. That's where we see this sort of sense of, of killability oh. becoming more attached. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. It's one of those, like, I don't know, macabre turns of phrase yeah, that sort yeah, of just emerge yeah. in writing. I mean, I'm sure other people people coined the term but um yeah yeah basically in the wake of this big broad colonial history i then wanted to to start to come back to some of those early accounts from people that are a little closer you know to trans women in the modern sense they're a little more you know some of them are a little more bourgeois and upper class and have a stronger sense of self um because that's where senses of selves emerged first in terms of class yeah part of what i started to track was like this the classic scene of street level violence Right. And, you know, in New York City, Jenny June is this late 19th century, turn of the century 
you know, actually very wealthy <laughs> woman who goes like, you know, but like who can't figure out how to, you know, basically be a trans woman in that time period because it's not really like uh, an upper middle class thing, right? You mm-hmm. can still have a private mm-hmm. life dressing at home, but she like wants to be a woman out in the world. So she has to go slumming downtown. She has to go where working class people hang out because there are these cultures. Yeah, these public gay cultures that, you know, the historian George Chauncey has talked about in his classic book. The fairies. The fairies. Yeah. 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 Um, this sort of public image. And Jenny June is a sort of different kind of fairy because fairies, you know, if you go back to Chauncey's book, I mean, you know, they they have the eyebrows and sometimes <laughs> a little rouge on the cheeks and they're known <laughs> for their red cravats, right? But Jenny June actually wears dresses, right? Mm-hmm, so she's a mm-hmm. little different. She's more like a trans woman. And she writes in one of her memoirs just about what it was like dating in New York yeah, City, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, like, say, in 1885, she's, like, spending the summer, you know, in a neighborhood in Manhattan that's still mm-hmm. there today, you know, and kind of just cruising in the park as you still maybe could today um and she you know she she has a taste for young rough uh working class new york men but part of what she describes is like something very very modern which is like when she goes into a park and she's just sitting on a park bench on view and you know hunky guys approach her and start talking to her she has to manage disclosure she has to manage telling them that she's a fairy right and prior to that moment i don't see trans woman saying that but she's not having to tell them because they don't know she's having to tell them because they do know because they Mm -hmm. can read her because they can tell she's not the same as other women and that's what they're interested in in a kind of urban sex economy a lot of these girls are probably sex workers jenny june isn't because she's rich but other ones are right and so she talks about the danger right when men have a taste for trans femininity yeah right yeah. that gives you a certain cachet right it means men are around and interested it can be really exciting and fun it's also really dangerous because right. you know they seem to be confronted with this you know kind of trans panic dilemma we would you know recognize today right and so there's like that version of the story happening but the reason i'm glad you mentioned this other person named nancy kelly mm-hmm, you know, yeah. which was this uh, person's drag name this is in chicago on the south side a little bit later you know in the during the great depression nancy kelly is someone who basically gets up into drag on the south side and goes and dances because you can make a ton of money and it's the depression And Nancy Kelly has a lot of family to take care of. And actually, in an era where it's really hard for Black men (laughs) to get reliable, good wage work, like, hey, that was something that paid. And this is not just to be to be clear, it's not at gay bars, right? This is like for for men that are attracted exactly to like to this trans feminized, whether in this case, drag, but like figure, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so like Nancy Kelly, you know, basically does this work for some time. And the reason we know is that later, um, you know, he lived as a black gay man and, and did an oral history in which he talked about this period. And, and, and he, you know, describes, you know, during this period working as Nancy, the exact same kind of danger yeah. you know, that basically yeah. getting clocked on the street. Right. Even though like, you know, he was risking public trans femininity for for work, right? Put him at risk of of being beaten up and killed. Um, but part of what I thought is so helpful about pairing the two of them is like, okay, here's that modern trans panic, that kind of danger that trans women experience. Oh, but here's also someone who's not a trans woman again, a mm-hmm, black gay man, mm-hmm. very happily so, right. but who worked in drag and thus became um, assimilated under the sign of trans femininity in urban Chicago in the Depression. So I think it really tells us that like, at least by the early 20th century, the sort of street level violence, um, you know, that has really kind of come into existence in a way that is affecting both trans women and other, you know, gay men in particular. So I think that's like a key plot point. If we sort of see that 19th century mm-hmm. colonial history as a birth point, then then here's sort of like part two where we're seeing, ah, the kind of violence that that we pay attention to a lot today is really kind of forming in the wake of that old older state history of violence. And, you know, then you you do bring us to today um, mm. with with the stories of Cece McDonald and Jennifer Laude. You talk about how sort of the interpersonal violence, the street violence that you're talking about, and state violence mixed together, especially. And that's, that's sort of what we're left with, the, the like legacy that we have now in those two mm. cases. Can you just sort of catch us up to this moment mm. in that regard? Yeah, that's such a great way of putting it, Brian. It's like they, they kind of merge. So the state is giving carte blanche, right? 
men know. <laughs> if you, you know, attack a trans woman or even kill her, like you probably won't spend the rest of your life behind bars. That's regardless of what the law says about yeah. cross-dressing or sex work, although that does have an effect, right? So, you know, Jennifer Laude was a uh, was a trans woman in the Philippines who lived near a major U.S. naval right. base uh, and who, you know, spent an evening at a bar where American servicemen were often, you know, to be found while they were, um, you know, a- allowed to leave base <laughs> and where they often, mm-hmm. you know, purchased sex and companionship from young Filipinas. And her murder really led to this galvanizing political movement in the Philippines where people really made the argument quite forcefully and effectively that American imperialism <laughs> is what killed her. Mm. It's the continuing U.S. military presence in the Philippines, a former colony, that you know creates this unequal relationship between Americans and, you know, Filipinos in general, but that gets sort of recapitulated in the relationship between, like, you know, a white man in the in the U.S. service and a trans woman, and the and the U.S. actually protected the man who killed her, you know, preventing him from from being prosecuted. And that's sort of you know that's not the point of telling that story, but like you know, it's a really kind of incredible literalization mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of that it colonial is. history it with is, the interpersonal. Yeah. Yeah. And then C.C. McDonald, you know, folks probably remember um, just the outrage over what happened to her yeah. after she and friends were attacked in Minneapolis while just walking home one night very viciously and, you know, attacked by several um, white people. And in the course of defending herself, you know, she held out a pair of scissors and this guy stumbled into it and he ended up dying and she was arrested. For self-defense, she was charged and ended up, like most people facing criminal charges in the U.S., you know, accepting a plea bargain and spending time in, unfortunately, in a male facility, right? And it's like, that really reminds us that, like, okay, first of all, when trans women defend, or when Black trans women in particular, defend themselves, they can be arrested. That's how powerful yeah. trans panic is, yeah, right? right? They can go to prison for self-defense because, again, the state you know, has already made a series of declarations about the value in general of Black women's lives and of Black life in this country, but in particular of Black trans women's lives. And so I just think, again, it's that like how interpersonal violence transpires not just in a culture right that devalues trans femininity but under you know circumstances legally where the state already has sort of given a signal and often this manifests in reality right like i yeah. talk elsewhere california tried banning under the law trans panic defenses and people still end up getting yeah. <laughs> the yeah. charges reduced or acquitted um even though it's an illegal defense right it's just so incredible because this history is so long right the state has been signing off on trans misogyny more broadly for so very long, right, that it's actually quite hard to undo it. And then I I just think that that gives us more to understand instead of blaming individual people's psychology or kind of becoming like true crime. You know, I don't want to, I never want to turn this stuff into true crime. Yeah. It's so misleading and then it takes us away from like the actual causes and effects of violence. Uh, Well, we have a lot more to talk about, but let's take a short break and we will be back after that. We have to talk about queens. So this I is think cha- why. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, I think, the third chapter of the book that you sort of cover explicitly. So we're talking about sort of mid twentieth century, early to mid twentieth century, the relationship between gay culture, gay men, and and trans women. In that, you use this figure of the queen as your sort of organizing principle for exploring that relationship. And we, you know, we mean like the way that in in uh, gay argot you would call someone a queen, but you you take it much further than that in, in really fascinating directions. Can you define for us what you sort of see the figure of the queen as um, and why you thought that that was the right way into this this really interesting relationship? Yeah. I mean, the way that we call people queens today, like in everyday speech, is sort of an artifact of this earlier time yeah. period. Yeah. Right. And it's like, it's because today we're told, okay, like trans women and gay men, those are very different not appropriate to conflate them, right? That's like taken a lot of years to convince people. Right. 
but it's always sort of left me, you know, kind of scratching my head a little bit. I'm mm. like, okay, but sometimes beautiful women like me used to be <laughs> gay life, right? And yeah, I don't sure. mean like I was a gay, I was not like a gay man. I, I was like, in some ways, not very successful, but like I lived in the gay world. Mm-hmm. I was part of that mm-hmm. culture. And sure. I'm really grateful for that. That's how I was socialized. That's how I learned about sex. Like, that's the first place I found any modicum of acceptance for femininity. And I think what's really interesting is if you go back to the mid 20th century, we find that there's the, before that split, you know, um, Queen is actually not just like the place where, you know, gay men and trans femininity touch, but actually, it has to do with the way class used to work in the mm-hmm. gay world, right? And yeah, so, you yeah. know, back in the day, you know, part of what was interesting about, you know, gay bars I- in U.S. cities was that, you know, basically they had a little bit more class mixing than most of American society because anyone afraid of being outed would go, you know, clandestinely if they wanted to have community or get drunk or hook up. They'd right, right, sure. go to a gay bar, right? <laughs> And so you did have bankers alongside hairdressers, right? Things were a little a little bit more mixed than elsewhere or any other bar, you know, that you'd find. But interestingly, um, you know, the difference between like a feminacy, like real Nelly Queens uh, and <laughs> mask gays was actually mostly a class distinction. Mask right, gays, the right, people right. who were more invested in being closeted tended to be people in the middle classes. And that makes so much sense, right? If they were outed, they would lose their jobs. They could lose. They were trying everything. to move in the worlds that they were used to. Move. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, being effeminate, especially in public, basically meant you would lose everything, right? If you went all the way, right, you could become... Yeah, I love that phrase, all the way. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, you know, like, I think that, but that was like a real fascination and a fear, right? And so what's really interesting is like, you know, say in the 60s, you know, in the mid-century, drag queens were really looked up to the ones who performed on stage because they were the only ones who dared to embrace the primary stigma of homosexuality. They were not just effeminate, they got dressed up as women, right? Mm -hmm. And then they earned this kind of armor, right? They were the only ones who could make fun of straight people. They could be so irreverent. They were celebrated. But in part, it's because it was kind of respectable. It was their job. And at the end of their act, they would get out of their drags and they would never leave the club dress. Because if you did, not only was that illegal, but you would be shunned you know, you would be considered trash. And there's this whole group of people, right? So there are drag queens on stage, but there's this other group of people. And they were called street queens. Street queens, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a whole gamut of these kinds of people. You know, we there's like hair fairies. There's people who are <laughs> like, you know, very effeminate gay men, or maybe, you know, some people would see that more as like non-binary or something. But like, you know, people who aren't like trying to be taken to be women. But then mm-hmm. there's this class of street queens who like are. Yeah. <laughs> they would like to be women. Right. They don't usually pass. They're really poor. They lose everything for their femininity, but they commit the cardinal sin of being feminine in public, off stage, And that is considered literally low class, but it's actually like a vector of impoverishment. You cannot even get a job as a female yeah. impersonator if you're a street queen, right? And everyone starts calling them transy in the 60s, right? So there's this character, there's this real kind of person that used to live all over the United States in big cities, and not for nothing. People like Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, they're street queens. They right. use all sorts of different language at different times, but they're from that particular class, right? And they are often the girls that work the street. Well, I love that you encourage us to think about them as as this category rather than yeah. like the way that we sort of, and we'll, maybe we'll get into this, is the way that the modern pride like uh, apparatus sort of refers to them now as as trans women of color. Like that, that, does, that kind of obfuscates their world and who they who they really were. Yeah, no, I know I love it. It's like this was the class regime of pre-Stonewall gay life in the United States, right? Where, yeah. you know, the primary risk of stigma, whether you were gay or trans, right? It doesn't really matter. The the risk was that you would lose everything. Mm-hmm. You would lose the ability to work, your family would disown you. You wouldn't be able to get an apartment. You would be out on the street. It is not a metaphor. Like people's lives really were ruined and they had to form these kinds of networks of of solidarity and mutual aid to take care of each other. And you know, most people were like, I don't want to live like that. Mm. And yet, and yet these queens, 
held such fascination because they had sunk all the way to the bottom. Mm. And in that regard, they had so much more power than anyone. More power even than a drag queen on stage because they had fallen to the depths, right? (laughs) And in that sense, they were exalted. It's that funny interplay, right? And here's where I think actually like, Gay culture has been obsessed with this question for a long time. Like, ooh, is the girl who's like gone all the way, so to speak, fallen as far as you can fall? What if she's the freest of all because she has no fucks left to give? Yeah. No one can pull any shit on her because she has nothing left, right? She doesn't right. have it mirrors yeah, it mirrors the diva, right? The the, the fallen, yeah. the fallen. Like it there's such a exactly that that, that dynamic is so core, I think, yeah. to, to sort of the gay, gay imagination. Totally. And like, it's what's really interesting is during this period, like some of the street queens, a lot of them are like trans women, right? Like they would like to transition, but they can't, they can't afford to, they would be kicked out of any clinic they went to. Some of them, you know, work as drag queens, they call themselves drag queens, right? Um, But these are people who just don't really qualify in the kind of post Stonewall and then also like the 21st century understanding of trans people, right? As like an identity category or like, you know, something that Like, well, you just choose whether you want to transition or not. Like, uh, these girls didn't get to make choices like that. They're just surviving, right? And often doing um, survival sex work. But I'm just really interested because this this kind of person, the queen, the figure and the real people were profoundly rejected after Stonewall. Yeah. Kicked out of gay liberation. We said, we being like the LGBT movement was like, no, thank you. We don't want anything. You are the most disreputable among us. We are going to get rid of you to clean up our image, to get acceptance from society, especially gay men and and lesbians, the ones that kind of had these anti-trans beliefs in the early 70s. They're like, wait a minute, we have a shot at being healthy homosexuals, as they used to say. We can just be (laughs) men and women, right? And like, if our our sexuality is just sort of a private choice, right, then we could kind of fit into American society. We don't have to suffer this kind of loss of status anymore. And that is really a pivotal history. It means we've left behind the queen. And so like the queen kind of survives on as this artifact and this kind of fascination. But I still feel like there's something there in just the narrative force of the fallen queen who could yeah. rise again. A queen is a leader, right? Mm-hmm, she's a sovereign. Mm-hmm. She's a head of state. Like, okay, I'm not a monarchist, right? But the whole point <laughs> is this is very campy. Indeed. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And no. so like... She holds court. No. She holds court, right? Like, these aren't really metaphors. They're kind of true. And so I end up spending a lot of time with um, one of my favorite, you know, novels from from the 50s, John Ritchie's City of Night, a classic, which tells the story of, of, for example, this queen named Miss Destiny, who is based on Mm -hmm. a real person um, in Southern California. And it's just like, I just want us to think about, because I I don't know, you know, obviously there's that personal investment for me. Like, I feel sad sometimes that gay men and trans women have to pretend we're Mm. so different. And I don't think, like... I'm not afraid of 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 the overlap. I think it's yeah. really interesting. And I think it can like bring us back to these figures like the queen and ask about also like our most fervent wishes and desires and extravagant <laughs> <laughs> ideas about what a good life would be like and what freedom might look like. And that basically, you know, if the street queen had been the person in whose name, you know, gay liberation had was really, actually fought. Yeah, yeah. Then we would be living in a really different world because the street queen I mean, she needs housing, you know, she needs she needs to be protected from the police. She needs hormones. She needs surgery if she wants it. She needs material change, right? She doesn't need the same things that, you know, LGBT civil rights have gone after. I I think you share you share really well that it leads to an entirely different politics. If you if you follow that Mm. person's that figure's lead versus but it also means we don't have to give her up the queen, right? Like, I, I mean, I'm curious to like, not to ask <laughs> questions, Brian, but like, I am kind of curious for the view from the other side, because like, I don't know, like there's a, a kind of, I think it's hard to be camp these days as something to do with like how culture has changed. But I think it has to do with this history too. Everything is so fucking serious these days. But like, I just think about like, you know, my most fervent attachments and desires as a child. And they were two, like, ridiculous, exaggerated Hollywood starlets. And, like, just this idea of, like, a regal, divine, diva-esque life, like, living like royalty, like, being a beautiful, just beauty, right? And that doesn't have, for me, that did end up meaning, like, oh, I should be a woman so I could, like, literalize it. But 
but it's also like real for a lot of gay men. And I just feel like we've been tragically sort of forced to give that up. So one of the things that one of the core sort of things that your book brought to mind for me, uh, and I think is a way of answering that question is, um, I, I have for, for a while now felt kind of mournful about the loss of, uh, under the banner of gay, under like gay man, uh, of space for like the fairy, the, the effeminate queen, I would use that, actually use that word. And the sense that, and I hope this, I don't mean this to sound like the, the sort of turfy complaint about like the trans are stealing all of our, our butch- butches. That's not what I mean. But there's a sense of sometimes where I'm like, God, the gender, the gender has to be the rubric under which you express all of these wonderful qualities of femininity that I think is, is the best of being a gay man to me is the pr- opportunity to explore those realms <laughs> and, and, and like, like, and those values and those those habits. So there is something lost, right? There is there's something. It's a shame that that split happened. And, the, and you write about this too: the masculinization of the gay male culture and and all of that. But it's 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 sad. It's really sad. I, I share. I think I share your your sense of sadness about that because it didn't used to be that way, and it and it doesn't have to be. But the way the way we've structured our mm. our sort of politics and movement in the last forty years has really made it hard to to live in those spaces um and and those figures aside from really the drag queen i think is the only the only one that still survives a little bit but uh otherwise it's tough to be femme <laughs> you know uh it's not it's not valued uh, right. i mean it's still and i struggle with that I've- just to say that's what makes this part of the book about trans misogyny, right? The, the sort of idea after Stonewall was that to be taken seriously, to make social progress and to do politics, we have to literally leave behind poor trans femininity. Like backwards in time, This is these are drags on our modernity. And I actually think that is the really disturbing story yeah. of LGBT progress. Um, which I think I think that makes sense to people now, though, because I think the the horrible returns of the hashtag transgender tipping point have just been so obvious yeah. to us all. We're all kind of like, oh, yeah, you know what? I think we've really, you know, which makes it weird that trans women, particularly black trans women, are always like held up as the icons of this movement, because it's like to me, that's that's just an anxiety being expressed about the fact that, well, no, really, it's been selling out those people that has like you know, basically been the wager of of LGBT liberalism. And just to say, right, I think one of the the most, I mean, other than the tragedy of leaving behind those incredible people or or working against them, they're not gone, right? Um, the other tragedy is it didn't work for gay people. It did not reduce homophobia, right? Like, here we are. They're fucking don't say gay laws. People want to ban <laughs> gay marriage. It just didn't work. It was a failing strategy. We gave up everything amazing and queeny. And what did we get? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Nothing. Marjorie Taylor Greene. She's still here, right? And that... She does not have any sense. Why do I keep mentioning Marjorie Taylor Greene? This is the second episode in a row. I just clocked myself. I don't know what my problem is. Anyways. I wanted to leave us with just a little bit of, um, I don't want to say hope exactly, but you do end the book with maybe a a different vision uh, for what what could sort of maybe actually overcome uh, trans misogyny. And, and I like one of the things you say throughout the book, actually, is that it's important to the reason one of the reasons for this is showing that it is not, in fact, like innate or like it, it this didn't have to be this way, right? This is not just like, a, a like you said, psychological or sort of natural, <laughs> like structure of things. It was invented at a specific time or it emerged at a specific time and it, it's developed over these two centuries. But if it's not innate, if it does, if it is sort of constructed or, or of a moment, it can be overcome, right? There's something hopeful there. And you leave us with this great note that trans women are extra, uh, trans femininity is too much as the core of something, I think uh, that's a different way of thinking about things. So just give us a little hint of that uh, before we go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just love this like reversal of expectation. Everything about serious politics and serious culture, even honestly, mainstream feminism has been anti-feminine, right? It's like, we got to get serious. We need to be strong, right? Women can't just be tawdry stereotypes and artifice and cockpits, <laughs> no, right? Like, just look at any woman politician and how much pressure mm. she's under to be like masculine, but then how many penalties she incurs for being masculine, right? Like, 
the LGBT movement too has basically said if we get rid of femininity, you know, if we minimize it, maybe we'll gain respectability and it failed. So I simply propose, what if we do the opposite? What if we say, actually, yeah, you know what? And a lot of trans women say things like this, depending on where they come from in the world, that they're like, no, I'm not a woman. Women, that's kind of generic. Honey, I'm, mm, mm-hmm, I got a little mm-hmm. something extra. <laughs> and sure, that sometimes does mean what you think it means, but it means so much more, right? It's about saying, hey, I'm not going to be limited. Let's embrace abundance. We're not in a scarcity mindset of there's only so much gender uh, or femininity to go around. We can have as much of it as we want. But what that really means is the rallying cry says, what kind of world would we have to create in which like, the people who are the most women, the most feminine, were actually appreciated for that, right? That's the reversal. And and that's a huge project. This is, I think, the fun part of it readers could check out or listeners could check out by reading. I, I look at some of the different um, places in Latin America where travestis and other people, trans feminists, are making that kind of claim using this word. In Isima, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The most woman. That's great. That's and great. it's just like a total rejection of saying, like, we got to step in line and be kind of severe, well-behaved women in order to be respected. Fuck that. That doesn't got us shit. You know, like, now is the time to embrace the most and see what the most can do for you. Because you know what? I have to say, <laughs> as a trans woman who has had a yeah. taste of being the most in many different ways, it's pretty incredible. And, and there are days where I'm like, this is so good. I don't even know how to explain how good it is. And I just am getting tastes of it because if the world were realigned to include encourage that, then that's something that would be available to everyone. So I'm not, my argument is not everyone should become trans women or that everyone should become feminine, but that we should think about, although if you want to. I mean, sure, yeah. (laughs) But the claim is sort of more like, you know, imagine what that would do to our mindset, right? There's no trans panic if you actually see the most of something as positive value. Oh my gosh, it's so much (laughs) extra. Woo! And believe me, a lot of men do have that reaction. So it's about like severing the link between that desire and the violence. So I think there's good news, right? And I think there's good news when we listen to particularly poor trans feminine people, trans feminized people, and just like think about what they know best because of the violence that they've been through. They have an incredible repertoire of knowledge and experience, and I'm just endlessly inspired by them. Oh, thank you so much, Jules. This this is uh, the book is just so exciting. Talking to you has made me want to go jump right back into it all over again. For listeners, the title again is A Short History of Trans Misogyny. It is by someone that you know and love, Jules Gold Peterson, our dear co-host. Please go pick it up, share it with everybody. I think it's going to make a big impact. Thanks for writing it, Jules. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you for reading, Brian. And thank you for, for talking with me. This is a very meaningful conversation. Like I said, I think this is actually a book like, sure, it's for the dolls, but it's also a book to like bring all of us together and I just think there's so many people who have cherished relationships to trans women or trans femininity who aren't trans women you know and it's like thank you for being one of them (laughs) Uh, proud to be All right, everybody, that is it for this episode. As always, please send us feedback and topic ideas at outwardpodcast.slate.com or via Facebook and X at Slate Outward. I keep reminding you of this, but we are going to be doing more advice uh, episodes every month. So please send your questions. We've been getting more, which is great, but we'd love to see even more. And, you know, those can be about queer relationship dynamics, uh, souring friendships, hard work decisions, nosy family, anything like that. You can send those to us at outwardpodcast.slate.com. And we, again, really love voice memos, so we can hear you but email is okay too uh as always just a reminder that by joining slate plus you'll get ad free podcasts extra segments on shows like working and you'll never hit a paywall on the slate site learn more about that you can go to slate.com slash outward plus our show is produced by the wonderful palace shaw if you like outward please subscribe in your podcast app tell your friends about it rate and review the show uh so that everybody can join in with us uh until next time thank you jules hey stay gay stay gay everybody <laughs>